Well, those of you who are joining us by way of Facebook, this is actually obviously totally live because we just got carried away. I'm mindful that we're a little late getting started. So thanks for joining us today, and uh, we're grateful that, that you're here with us. And uh, this morning's message uh, is from the Bible, as it should be, and it's from a passage in the Bible. In John chapter 2, if you'd like to turn to that chapter, the very beginning of it, it's uh, the very first miracle that Jesus, the record, very first recorded miracle of Jesus in, uh, at the wedding in Cana. And it's about turning water into wine. And uh, for many people, uh, in, in most really nice restaurants, uh, one of the highlights of, of the dining experience is that day's wine offerings. For those who enjoy wine and know a good wine and know how to savor and enjoy that, that is a, a big part of the dining experience. Those who enjoy wine know that a really nice wine can make a really nice dinner all the more enjoyable. And wine is something that most uh, everyone uh, knows about and many, many people can relate to. There's a world of difference, and this really struck me as I was thinking about this message and just about life in general. There's a world of difference between water and wine. I mean, that's part of the miracle here. And, and you, you, you can live without wine, but you can't live without water, right? But, but once water becomes wine, anybody who's drinking it knows that's not water anymore. And wine is uh, often associated, uh, again, hopefully without getting drunk, wine is often associated with the gladness of heart and, you know, being merry. That wine is, a, is, a, is, is just a gift that God gives to those who can enjoy it without uh, using it. And, and then, so as we think about this, uh, and of course, in that culture, in that time, you know, wine is a big part of life. And, and so when we think about this miracle and we think about its significance, and that's the title of the message, the significance and the subtlety of Jesus' first miracle. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody necessarily would have expected it, you know, but it came and it was there that it happened. Underneath the title, it says, water into wine may not seem like that big a deal, but it sure is. It was a big deal to the wedding party and the host that, there that day for sure. So here's the theme this morning. When Jesus turned water into wine, he was doing way more than just that. Uh, the, the, the miracle on the surface is meant to make a proclamation concerning not just the miracle on the surface, but the miracle worker, and then the results of that miracle. And so certainly that's uh, the, the truth for this first recorded miracle. And here's the application for this morning's message. Let your life be the water and see what a difference he can make through you. Uh, that's one of the, I think, one of the biggest takeaways we can take away from this. Not just the, the significance of the miracle itself, but, but uh, the implications of what that can mean, not just for them there in that moment, but, but for us here now in the moments of our life. And here's the focus uh, of, of this morning's message. Uh, one, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories from my days at Lakeland Community College comes from a biology class I took. The instructor had planned an outdoor class to help educate us concerning local plants. On the way to the spot she picked out, she tripped, and on her way down, the several books and many notes she was carrying went flying all over the place. Without skipping a beat, she popped back up, looked right at all of us, and said, teaching device, first grab their attention. I mean, that's thinking on your feet, isn't it? Because it was a mess. She went down hard. Most of the books went that way. All of the papers went everywhere. And then she, it was, I mean, it was so funny because she didn't skip a beat. And, she, and uh, yeah, what a great one. Teaching device, first grab their attention. And then, you know, every, thankfully everybody helped push everything out. But that, that was a moment. Well, about grabbing t attention. Apparently Jesus missed that memo when it came to his first recorded miracle as, be as he began his earthly ministry. It's so seemingly inconsist inconsistent, it can seem like an odd first way to demonstrate the authority and power he had. One might think would it, he would have gone straight to raising Lazarus from the dead if he wanted to get people's attention, you know, straight out of the gate. Hopefully, we'll see there's way more to this than meets the eye, and that Jesus can do with our lives what he did with that one. That's certainly my prayer for those of us that, that we need to hear this message and, and uh, 
and that all of us would somehow experiencing our lives being the water and him making the wine. It's all about the difference he makes. So here's this passage, John chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we'll read through uh, verse 11. So John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. In other words, big. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out. And... Uh, take it to the master of the banquet for him to approve. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs. And let me just in, insert, I don't know that I'll say it again, but the word that's often used in the narrative is signs, not miracle. What we call, what we call a miracle is, from God's point of view, is a sign. And what's a sign for? To get your attention and to read it, right? And so, so it says, this was the first of the signs through which Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And then after that, it says he went down to Capernaum and with his mother and brothers and disciples, and they stayed a few days. That's the entire part of that narrative. But as you think about that, and uh, again, the significance of it, it's, it's a miracle that God calls a sign uh, that, that Jesus was able to do that, right? You, I, you, that's not a magic trick. He literally changed the composition of the, of the water and turned it into really good wine. That is called miracle. And so uh, here's what we want to see from this passage and then some application. The, the first point this morning is this. God does what he does his way in his time. If, if you haven't gotten that yet, Eventually, you probably will, and then you'll find yourself saying, like everybody else along the way, oh, he's in control, I'm not, right? What he does, where he does it, when he does it, with and through whom he does it, he does it. And, and we have got to get to the point where, where we are really okay with that, because that's reality. Under the first point, it says, of all the places Jesus could have done his first miracle, he chose a wedding, which is its own statement too, right? It really is. I'm not trying to read into it something that's not there. I'm not trying to pull out of it something that's not inside of it. But it, it's just significant that the very first miracle that Jesus does is turning water into wine. So this passage of Scripture that we just looked at, John chapter 2, verses 1. 1 through 11. It's pretty familiar to most people, I would imagine. And I want to say this right now, that we'll spend no time debating whether it happened or not. That's another discussion for another time. If you want to go there, uh, you know, I'd be glad to uh, meet with you or talk with you or whatever uh, about the, the authenticity of, of this. But the, 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 the story exists in the Bible as an affirmation that it did indeed take place started out as water became wine and uh, the, the, the banquet host uh, was blown away that it was typically the wine someone would serve at the beginning of the gathering and then after people have had uh, you know a, a, a little more wine they're not as keenly aware of the quality of the wine and so they would bring out the lesser stuff but that's part of what this the, 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 the host was 
blown away by you saved the best for last. Well, no, he didn't. It's what Jesus made. But if you want to go there or you want to say that, that's fine. Um, uh, so what we will look at is the interaction between Jesus uh, and his mother and how it is this miracle impacted his disciples. So look back up there to uh, um, this, the uh, second verse. Uh, I'm sorry, the third verse. When the wine was gone, which is, you know, the worst thing that can happen at a party. You run out of food. You run out of, you know, the wine, whatever is supposed to be. You, you don't want to run out. So they run out of the wine. Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And his response can sound almost snotty, right, or disrespectful. I mean, it's really staggering when he says, he doesn't say mom or, or mother. He says, woman, what do you, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And, and you would think that that response from Jesus would blow off whoever the person was who came to him as if, as if to, to say, just leave me alone. This is, this is not anything I need to deal with. But who was it that said it to Jesus? His mother. Which makes her response all the more amazing. Because she didn't just look down on the ground and say, oh, okay, never mind. She knew her son. And she knew what he was going to do. Look at the fourth verse. Um, I'm sorry, the fifth verse. His mother said to the servants, oh, he's not going to do it. We best be on our way. No. His mother says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Was it something in his eye that gave it away? His look in his eyes? How did she know he wasn't blowing her off? That's just, that's just a mystery to me because his response sounds dismissive, get away, leave me alone. But that's not what happened. She knew who he was. And apparently she knew not only that he could do something, but that he would do something. Do whatever he tells you. So this isn't the end of the, end of the story. And then you read what happens, gets uh, tons of water, turns all of it into wine. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, the guests, of course, are very, very happy. And the servants who got the water know what happened. But that's part of what makes the miracle so, so significant because it is so subtle. He didn't, as some might be wont to do, say, okay, everybody, gather around. Check this out. You know, there wasn't any anything grandiose about it. They just poured the water in. When did it happen? Kind of like the fishers and the loaves. When were they were they were they multiplied as they reached in? Were they, you know, what what were the mechanics of that? The Bible doesn't say so. We don't know. But we do know that if from this particular miracle, it was just water. Somehow or another, he did something to it. And water is what went into those cisterns, and wine is what came out. But there wasn't any grandstanding. There wasn't any showboating. Didn't blow any trumpets or say, again, you know, like, hey, everybody, I'm going to do my first miracle. And because no, very few people knew what he did, the servants and the disciples and his mom. There's no indication that the party goers or the people at the wedding had any idea how this came to be. They didn't even know it was a miracle what they were drinking. That it was a sign from God that this is the Messiah. They had no clue. So this first miracle is so subtle, but incredibly uh, significant. And again, without belaboring this, this is the very first recorded miracle in the Bible. Not the raising of the dead, not driving out demons, not healing, not the cleansing of the leprosy. Turning water into wine is the very first thing Jesus did after the baptism of he, he, he goes to this wedding and turns water into wine. And, and um, if nothing else, the significance of the wedding is that a, a, a wedding is a place of celebration that's full of promise and hope. He went to where people were enjoying life and enjoying each other. And he made it all the more enjoyable, didn't he? Didn't he? And the, and the, the, the difference he makes is... Uh, is, is so beautiful. And who but Jesus could do such a thing? And who but God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who but God uh, knows how even at that point Jesus hoped that we might connect the dots to show how clearly this speaks of his uh, identity and mission straight out of the gate. He goes to a wedding, first recorded earthly miracle, goes to a wedding 
and turns water into wine. Right? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Talk about connecting the dots. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. This is uh, in the NIV. The heading is the threefold hallelujah over Babylon's fall. And that's in chapter 19. And when we uh, look at uh, after the, the hallelujahs there, uh, if you look at the sixth, starting in the, in the sixth verse. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like, a, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah for our Lord God reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And something inside you should go, wedding? Jesus' presence? Right? It's just staggering that the very first thing he did was go to a wedding. And the very last thing, the very last thing before the new heaven and earth, that, that this passage, which transpires right before the banishing, the thousand-year banishing of Satan and the thousand-year reign, uh, the, the millennial, the, and the, you know, that's where people are with their eschatology and the return of Christ. It's a whole other thing, too. Whether this, when this will be in, the, in time as we know it as it plays out. But it is significant that before the millennial reign and the thousand-year containment of Satan before he's released one last time, it says... For the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and wine, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy church. So his earthly ministry starts with a wedding. And the culmination of all time for the set uh, experience of eternity involves the wedding of the Lamb. And who's the bride? His church. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that's just staggering in, in, its, in its absolute beauty. And again, the, um, back to the John chapter 2, the, the response of Mary should uh, grab our attention. And, and we should be like her in this. She knew who he was, and she knew what he could do. And that should be you and I in an ever-growing way. We know who he is, and we know what he can do. What can he do? Anything he wants. What will he do? Anything we ask, if it's according to his will. And the more we get to know him, the more we know how to pray. And so, just praise God for the, the beauty of, of where the first miracle took place. And praise God for how, not just how subtle it is, but even how subtle the connection can be made all the way to Revelation chapter 19 from John chapter 2. You can just transport right over there because now we can look all the way back on it at what God has done and what the Bible tells us is ahead. We can look over that and see wedding, Jesus' presence, wedding, Jesus' presence. And, Beautiful, beautiful thing. And the second and last point this morning concerning uh, the insight and application from this wedding in Cana is this. The first point, God does what he does his way in his time because he's God all by himself. And the second point is this. He, Jesus, can turn the water of lifeless living into the wine of new life. And that's where I want to park for just a moment. To understand that, yes, in a way similar to what he did to that water, he wants to bring that significant transformation to you. He wants to change who you are. He wants to change, as it were, your composition, right? The desires of your heart, the, 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 the trajectory of your life from a godless eternity to a God-filled eternity to be able to celebrate that. So the second point this morning, yeah, is I already said that he can turn the water of lifeless living, your life, and any lifeless living in your life, any life in the dark, any life full of sin, any life full of despair, any life full of hopelessness. No, 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 no. 
let that become wine. Let, let your life be transformed in, in such a deep and profound and complete way. It was no longer water. It was wine. And everybody knew it. And when God changes somebody's life, the recipient of that change knows it. If that water could have talked, it would have said, whoa, right? Or something like that. Uh, used to be water, not water anymore. And that's what it should be for us. Used to not be a Christian. Now I'm a Christian. Used to not have hope. Now I have hope. Used to not really have any purpose or any plan. Now I have a purpose and God's given, God showed me his plans. It's all new now. It's all different now. Under the second point, the transformation that God brings to us is no less mysterious and magnificent. How does God change a person? How, as, as sure as we can no, no sooner explain the miraculous hows of human conception. I mean, biologically, you can throw some words together to explain it. But beyond, but beyond explaining the process, uh, you know, what, what takes place, how do you explain it itself? And, and the same thing with, with the, the, the transforming of water into wine. You can't explain it, you know, in totally scientific and uh, just physical terms. But here's, here's, here's all those servants and Mary and Jesus, of course, and, and his disciples. That used to be water, and now it's not. Somebody changed it. And that's what God can and definitely desires to do, not just in you, but to you. Uh, in, in the difference he can bring. Turn with me there to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Many of you know this verse already. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 17. It's right after the book of Romans, right after the book of 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 17 says this. Prior to that, in verse 7, it talks about living by faith, not by sight. And in verse, uh, yeah, verse 17, it, uh, the Bible says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. If any man be in Christ, there's a new creation. Not a, not a remodeled one, not a painted over one. This isn't a make-o-paint job. This, this, this is, a, brand, this is a, creation, a creation that didn't used to exist before the second birth, and now there's a new creation called child of God. And as sure as that water was no longer just water, it was wine. We are still human beings, but now we're transformed and alive spiritually. And we're new creations. Again, very clear. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You're not who you used to be. We've spoken, and we'll look at it in Romans 6, the, the, the image of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. That a, a total transformation and a total new experience in life. Butterflies don't crawl around on the ground, they fly. Um, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. And again, the, 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 the difference that God m makes is miraculous. What he does in and through the lives of his children. And I didn't say this yet. As sure as all that good wine, six, 25 to 30 gallons, what is that? Uh, you know, 120 at least, uh, 100, 150 at least gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine for a big party. As sure as uh, all that good wine had a great impact on that celebration. Our lives should do the same thing as well, right? Uh, that, that it is a, a celebration of life. That that God gives it to us. It, it costs us nothing. He pays in full for it. And this is part of the irony or the paradox. It costs us nothing to receive it by faith. And then it demands everything as we follow. I'm not saying that we earn our way to heaven after becoming a Christian any more than we earn our way to becoming a Christian. But as a result of being a Christian, though it's free to receive, it, it'll cost, you know, what, what profits it a man gains the world but loses his soul? 
And so the cost that he paid to rescue us now calls us to pay the cost of full surrender to follow him for life. Anyway, uh, uh, as sure as all that wine made a difference in that celebration, our lives should make a difference in this world. So we've looked at 1 Corinthians 5.17. Again, if, uh, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And then turn with me, I mentioned a moment ago, just back uh, over the past 1 Corinthians, back to Romans in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It's a passage that I almost always refer to and that I'm pretty sure uh, when I've uh, been honored to do baptisms. I know, Josh, when you were baptized, this was a passage that I shared that you and I looked at together, actually. Um, uh, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? That my identity through baptism is death to sin and alive in, in Christ. And the, the, the case Paul's making here is sin should not have the place in our lives that it had before we were placed into God's family. It shouldn't. Something's terribly wrong if it's still done. You have to ask some very hard questions. By no means, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism. That's the symbol of being immersed in baptism. Buried with him uh, through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead for the, through the glory of the Father, we too may live what? A new life. Not a different life, though it will be different, but it's going to be different because it's a new life. Someone who wasn't alive is alive now. Alive forever in God by his spirit. And so that that, that, that this, not just the symbolism of that, but the actual significance of that, the reality of that, that this is, that baptism is like a wedding ring. That, that, that a wedding ring is placed on the hand after the vows are made, after the covenant is established. And that's the same thing with, with baptism. You, you, you get baptized to, uh, to affirm your identity as a Christ follower. And you identify in Jesus' death on the cross and death to the world so that you as his child can walk in newness of life. Do you see that? that and, and, the, and again, both the simplicity and the beauty of that. And putting a ring on your finger doesn't make you married. You put a ring on your finger because you are married. And the same thing with baptism. Bat being baptized doesn't make you a Christian, but being a Christian calls you to be baptized, to identify in, in, in Christ's death and to fully identify with him for whatever's left of your life till you do physically die. The point being <laughs> that when somebody becomes a Christian, somebody who didn't used to exist now does. And that's what baptism symbolizes. That old life, before I was his, is gone. And now all that's ahead is a brand new life. That's what's ahead. Because I'm a brand new creation. Again, going back to the line in the song. Second Corinthians. Inspired by the same Holy Spirit, written by the same Apostle Paul. So, and then this one last passage, uh, and we'll read the whole passage, but I just want to highlight uh, that one verse. Uh, so uh, go past uh, 2 Corinthians to Galatians to Ephesians, and we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. It says this, be very careful then how you live. And as a new creation that resonates with our hearts, we have to be very careful this world we live in is the same fallen world we were dead in sin in. So you have to be very careful. There are minefields all over the place. Be very careful, Ephesians 5.15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the point
point I want to highlight concerning the reference to wine here is please note, and for most people, it's an okay thing, but for some of us, it's not. Uh, and that's just how it is. But it doesn't say there's something, you, you must not drink wine. That's not what it says. It just says, don't get drunk, right? And so when, when, when he says that so clearly, so categorically, um, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So what he's doing here is using the image of being filled by the Spirit in, in, in what today people would say. And I, I, I hear people sometimes joke about it and say it irreverently. I'm definitely not wanting to do either of those things in any way right now. Absolutely not. But there is a very real uh, coral, corollary, corollary between if, so, if somebody's under the influence, typically the term they're under the influence is connected to drunkenness, to too much alcohol in their bloodstream. And what does it affect? It affects what they say, right? And how they say it. Hello? And, and, and the image is so beautiful there in that it's the same way when you're under the influence of, of wine or alcohol, it affects what you say and how you say it. And people can clearly see that that person's, you know, sauce, they're under the influence. God, Please make it so clear to those around us that we as Christians are under the influence, not of wine, but the Holy Spirit, which will affect what we say and how we say it. And that that connection that Paul makes there is, is, is just wonderful. You know what happens if you drink too much. It's not good. Here's what should happen. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and watch what happens. Do, do you, and I hope you see that. Uh, one's really, really bad. Don't get drunk. One's really, really good. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then that's on the heels of the call to you know, be careful how you live. And then it ends with acknowledging there that uh, the result of it isn't staggering or slurring your speech or passing out or falling down. It's singing. It's making music. It's worshiping God. Always giving thanks. That's what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And the upside of that is uh, something all of us, uh, I hope, will experience, especially as new creations. Because only new creations can really experience the way God intends that fullness of the Spirit. And so if you drink alcohol, enjoy it, but don't get drunk. And as a Christian, uh, make sure that you enjoy the Holy Spirit and let him fill you and let him animate you and empower you and launch you uh, into this world. I'll end with this. Last week, if you recall, we talked about salt and light, right? Do you remember that? I hope so. <laughs> if you heard it. And we talked about how, uh, how if salt is present and light is present and you taste the salt or you see the light, Nobody needs to tell you there's some salt or there's, there's light. It, it, it makes its own declaration simply by its existence, right? And its absence is the same way. I think I said like steak with no salt and guacamole with no salt. <laughs> you know, but when you put salt in that, oh, baby. And the difference that that makes and then the light, because as we talked about it last week, the absence of salt or light can go from something that's simply unpleasant to something that's actually dangerous. Because if you're in the darkness, you, you, you don't know danger that may be lurking right around you. You don't know what may be right around the corner. But you throw light on it, and now you have a whole lot more safety as you can navigate that. So as sure as salt and light make their presence known, we as Christians, God should be making his presence not just to us, but through us uh, in, in a way that is, is as significant as that water becomes that very first miracle. And again, that very first miracle caused the disciples, and I'm not sure there's any other episode that we have this for sure, that very first miracle caused the disciples to do what? Believe in him. He did something that they realized no other person could do, and they knew he did it. And they realized, we're going to stick with him. And as you continue to read the Gospels, it got a little heated, and then they questioned their commitment. <laughs> but, uh, but, they made that commitment because of that miracle, because they knew that was just water before uh, he, he had his way. 
So, yeah, may our lives be changed in such a way that the same way those guests at the wedding knew that was really good wine, that uh, those around us would know we're, we're, we're his, and that that would be its own statement. No shoving, no pushing, no screaming, no trying to coerce or manipulate. Be the salt, let your light shine. Let him turn the water of your life into wine. Let those around you enjoy him. A, friend, a, new, a newer friend of mine has this great phrase where he says, beauty will save you. And it is the beauty of who God is and the beauty of what God can do and the beauty of what God does that really brings somebody's attention to the great love of God. That he's who he is and it's not us. And may our lives be like that one. So here's a making it real question. Is your comfort level con uh, continuing to grow concerning this and that this is this? God does what he does uh, his way in his time. Brother, sister, fellow struggler, take your hands off it. Just let God be God. Let him call the shots. You pray, you trust, you obey, but let God be God. His timing. That's sometimes one of our biggest struggles is God's timing. But uh, his will, his way, his time. Get used to differences is what the, the chosen that said that Jesus talks about calling Matthew to join the tribe. And the second question is, what changes are you experiencing as God continues to change you? Our lives, again, without milking the metaphor, our lives should continually, should continually, be, continually be, keep becoming better and better wine, as it were. That our lives should be more, uh, sub, more substantial, more significant. And, and then welcome those changes that God brings. Paul also said somewhere in the New Testament that, that the, what God is doing is conforming us to the image of Christ. So we keep looking more and more like Jesus. Not just what would Jesus do, but what would Jesus think? What would Jesus say? What would Jesus' attitude be? And that's the refiner's fire that we're all called to. Here's the action step. Write down three places and three ways that come to mind concerning how you can be having an influence today. Three places in your life, three arenas of your life, or literal places, and then three ways that that uh, whatever comes to mind, and ask God to direct your thoughts uh, to be having a greater influence today, to be a, a more flavorful a wine, as it were, as He has it, and then ask God for the power to do that, and He will give us the power that we need to. You can't do his will if you don't know what to do. That's why you need one of these. <laughs> and uh, let him speak to you as you, as you encounter him today. So let's pray and give thanks uh, again for that very first miracle. He did that miracle to get his attention. I hope he's got our attention as well. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, may your uh, holy name be revered in our hearts. We do pray, God, your kingdom will come and your will will be done in and through us. We thank you together for being who you say you are. We thank you for doing what you said you did. Thank you for loving and setting us free. And we, we declare again with all of, of your people that you are who you say you are. You are kind. You are loving. You are good. And Jesus, please come to our lives, not in my kind of things like water or a wedding or candy. Please turn any lifeless living in our lives into the expression of new life in you. No doubt that, especially those who knew what you had done, no doubt that they knew the way it used to be wasn't the way it was. Because you had your let that be the story of our lives because you had your way in our lives. We're not who we used to be. And you're still conforming us into your likeness. And we do pray that the water of our life, transformed into the wine of new life, would grow stronger and better and even more pleasing to us. May our lives make Jesus more beautiful and more.
We pray for those here today and those who are joining us even down the road uh, for the pain that accompanies their lives in this fallen world. Physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain, relational pain. And it almost seems silly to say that pain hurts, but we know that it's real. And we pray that even if you won't take the pain away, you'll give us the grace to learn what you teach us through it how we down the road could be a blessing to somebody else who, who will be going through the pain that you brought us through. Thank you that you're able. Guide us, God, as we go from this place, from this time together, into the mission field that this world is, where we work, what we do, as this pandemic lessens its grip and we go back to being more among people us to be salt, help us to be light, help us to be that new wine in this world. Thank you, God, again, for being able to strengthen us, to move toward people always in your power, with your presence, demonstrating your love. And it's in Jesus' mighty name and matchless name that we always pray, and we pray in Jesus' name today, and together we say, Amen. Amen. Well, here's the benediction. Now go and invite Jesus to the wedding party of your life and invite others to join you. God bless you. You've joined us online. We'll continue to be praying for you. And may uh, God have his way in our lives. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm.